All right. So it's uh, 630 and I wanted to call to order the regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council. Today's October 19th and we will actually adjourn this meeting uh, to go into closed session and our closed session will last for one hour uh, and the items we'll be discussing are posted uh, three items conference with legal counsel for anticipated litigation public employee performance evaluation and conference with labor negotiators so uh, we will uh, conduct this for one hour and then reconvene here and report out on uh, or announce any reportable actions and then start our regular meeting with roll call and pledge of allegiance and public comment at 730. So we uh, apologize for anybody who is uh, jumping on right now thinking that the, the regular meeting would start at 630. This was noted, but it's a little unusual and we look forward to seeing everybody in one hour. So with that, we'll adjourn and be back at 730. Thank you. So you ready to go, Allison? Yeah. Thank you. So I'd like to call the regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council to order. Uh, I apologize to those of you who've been waiting. We uh, just ended our closed session and we have no reportable actions and we'll have to go back into closed session, You know, hence the delay. Um, it's just a lot of business items tonight. But anyway, welcome all of you. And uh, Allison, could we do a roll call, please? Council Member Kando. I am here. Council Member Hara. I'm here. Council Member Way. Here. Vice Mayor Paulson. Here. And Mayor Helmer is absent tonight and I'm sitting in his place. Uh, so the first, um, we would like to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So those of you who are able to rise, please do so. We might need a conductor. Um, <laughs> all right, but thanks for that. Uh, so this is only for matters not. So if anybody would like to uh, make public comment, you have three minutes to speak. And uh, if you would, please identify yourself and where you live. And uh, again, just remember if it's about uh, the business item 8.1 or anything else on the agenda, uh, please refrain and, and bring it up then. So, Allison, do we have anybody? Well, first in the chambers, anybody want to come up? And that looks like a no. And we'll come back to you if you do. Allison, anybody in the queue? Our Zoom? first comment will come from David Mahler. Welcome, David. Uh, well, good evening, Vice Mayor uh, Paulson, council members and staff. Uh, I'd like to follow up on some emails I sent out to each council member uh, earlier this month, requesting that three model reach codes that the county sustainability team distributed to all Marin jurisdictions in late August be placed on the Larkspur City Council agenda uh, in October or early November for a staff report and a public discussion. Uh, the model reach codes cover three topics, and all three are targeted at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in response to climate change. The three were all electric for new construction, energy efficiency and electrification for existing single family renovations, and electric vehicle infrastructure for new construction and, and renovations. In my email, I noted that Marin County's sustainability team developed these uh, three model reach codes over an eight-month period in collaboration with planning and building officials of all 11 Marin towns and cities, as well as participation and input by community stakeholders representing the developer, construction, environmental, affordable housing, senior and West Marin sectors. I also noted that the three model uh, reach codes line up with several actions in Larkspur's Climate Action Plan 2030. The three model reach codes are not a concept, they're fully developed they're written and ready to adopt language to minimize jurisdictional staff time needed to support their adoption. And process wise, they fit in well with the ongoing triennial building code updates that all jurisdictions are engaged in. 
So my comments this evening are intended partly to reinforce that request that a report and discussion of the three reach codes be placed on the council's meeting agenda. But primarily I want to inform you that yesterday the Marin County Board of Supervisors unanimously adopted all three of these model codes. Nine members of the public spoke in support of adoption and there were no public comments in opposition. I know the council has many items on its plate, but taking this important action to help avoid the worst impacts of climate change really needs to be a top priority. The 18 members of the Larks Climate Group and the more than 60 members of the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad really do appreciate the actions Larkspur has taken and will take to help reduce our community's greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks so much for this time. Great, thank you, David. And on a personal note, I have not forgotten uh, your, I just have not gotten to you on my list, but thank you for that. Uh, next public comment. Hands from our audience members. There's no further public comment. Okay, great. Uh, and one more time, anybody in the chamber want to speak? No, okay, great. So let's move on. Uh, the next business item is presentations, proclamations of which there are none. So we can move to the consent calendar and we have five items. Uh, does anybody in the public want to comment or pull an item from the calendar? Our first comment will come from caller ending in 1402. Welcome, James. Um, James Holmes, Larkspur. I'd like to um, uh, make a comment and uh, uh, a, a ask a question regarding 4.5. I don't know that a staff report is necessary. I'm sure that the council is familiar with that. But however, the uh, vice mayor wants to uh, uh, proceed. I, I would like to make a uh, to ask a question and make a comment regarding 4.5, please. Okay. Uh, is that okay, city manager? D um that's your discretion. Sure, go ahead and ask your question, uh, James. Uh, yes, um, as I say, question and a comment. Uh, it, this is 4.5 is the application to participate in a state pro-housing designation program. In the application uh, 1A, which is an attachment uh, to the uh, uh, staff report, um, uh, we say that we have 150% of all current or draft housing uh, mandate allocations, whichever is greater. Really, 979 plus 490? Uh, first, how can we make that determination in advance of completing the housing element update process? Second, in our prior appeal of the 979 uh, mandate, we said it would be a problem for us. Uh, and, uh, that seems like, and now we say we can do 50% uh, more. Uh, that sounds like uh, an admission against interest or a, um, an admission that our prior statements in our appeal were wrong. Further, there's a new uh, Levine-sponsored bill, AB 1445, that uh, requires um, housing allocations to take into account the very factors that we uh, cited in our appeal. If we now admit that we can satisfy 150% of the uh, required uh, vastly increased allocation, uh, isn't, uh, wouldn't that be a prior inconsistent statement that would undercut our ability in the future to use AB 1445 to get a reduced allocation? Additionally, uh, various parts of the application uh, claim points for all sorts of things, uh, such as uh, density bonus program that exceeds statutory requirements, uh, establishment of a workforce housing opportunity zone, uh, ministerial uh, approval process for a variety of housing types, minimize uh, kind, uh, levels of review and approval uh, of projects, uh, in connection with uh, providing financial uh, uh, 4A, application 4A talks about uh, providing uh, financial subsidies. It, we claim points for uh, low interest loans, uh, make publicly owned land available for affordable housing, uh, establish a uh, infrastructure financing district. Really, is all of this 
uh, claimed uh, uh, point uh, uh, pr program points accurate, and is it really consistent with uh, this council's stated desire to maintain local control and maintain community character to the extent possible? Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. Um, uh, city staff, would you like to respond? Yes, I think he may be misunderstanding what our application contains. So the, the state application has um, a long list of items that a city can apply for um, or programs that they could adopt and then get points towards the 30 points that needed for the application. And the city um, has, uh, and I would say what page number it's on, but the actual programs that the city's applying for start on page um, attach four point, item 4.5 attachment to, and it's, um, pay, well, for mine, it's 20 of 23 pages. And so just to address that first item, the, the draft inventory that the housing committee has looked at contains 230% of our arena, um, but that isn't an item that we're listing for the application currently because as Mr. Holmes says, we haven't adopted that draft yet, or it hasn't even come before you. So, um, and then a lot of the other items that Mr. Holmes listed are not items that the city is putting in the application as items that we're pursuing at this time. So um, the ones that we did include in the app draft application are ones that the city is actually already doing. And then there's a few that are being pursued, but those are items that um, like the objective design and development standards that are definitely underway by the city and have already been funded as projects. Um, I think the only one that's that the city council hasn't provided direction on would be um, some information on second units that the that the planning commission has talked about, but this, it hasn't come to the city council yet. And again, our application draft would be for 34 points. We only need 30. So there might be some leeway to drop um, even some of those um, projects, but just we aren't applying for all of the um, programs that are listed as potential point um, points for this application. Okay, thank you. Uh, city manager? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think just to clarify, because there's quite a number of pages labeled attachment to, I think the four itemized are in what's labeled appendix to, is that right, Elise? Mm. <laughs> uh, to the, it's the, essentially the last pages of the application. I the think, last four pages of the I, application. Yeah, but I, I think if you find what's listed as appendix two, those are the four things we're adding to our existing programs to qualify for this designation. So, oh, correct, right. Yeah. They're with the proposed deadlines for ones that haven't been completed already. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Allison, any other public comment? Any additional raised hands from our audience members? There's no further public comment. So I'll move the consent decree, uh, that consent uh, calendar. Okay, so we have a motion. Oh, second. Okay, Allison, can we have a roll call? Council Member Kandel? Yes. Council Member Hara? Oh, Kevin, you're on mute. Yep, uh, yes. Council Member yes. White? Vice Mayor Paulson? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, the five items of the consent calendar all passed uh, unanimous by four uh, council members. And uh, our next business item then is the city manager's oral report. Uh, I had two items. One's a public safety uh, message that I just want to get out there. Uh, I think a lot of folks in the community are aware that uh, we had a youth run into the street here in Magnolia and, and get hit recently. And it's a reminder to all everybody, but particularly to parents, to talk to your children about using crosswalks um, because some, you know, this is what can happen if you just run out and try to cross the street anywhere. Um, so with that said, then I'll transition. Uh, just wanted to acknowledge it's election season. Uh, we have a lot of folks who are, are out supporting different candidates and different measures, and they're putting signs up. And I get a lot of questions of what happened to the signs that were in the medians. Um, you're not allowed to put signs on public property. So we pull those off and they're at the uh, city's courtyard. And so if you're somebody who wants those signs back, you just need to call Public Works and they'll schedule a time for you to come down and get your signs. 
So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Vice Mayor. Great, thank you. Um, so let's move on then to council members' oral reports and comments. Any council member? Uh, council member Wayne, no. Um, Scott? Not today, sure. Not today. Uh, Kevin, anything? Uh, nothing. Wow. I have something. Um, so tomorrow is, uh, this is another public safety announcement. Um, you know, we don't think or talk much about earthquakes. So there is a called the great shakeout drill. So tomorrow is the 20th. So 10, 20, October 20th at 10, 20 in the morning uh, officially is, is the time that this national organization invites all of us to think for a minute what you would do in case of a large earthquake. And, and I think it's, it's just worth, you know, even taking a moment of reflection tonight. Uh, you know, do you have any plan? Do you know how you would contact your loved ones? Would you meet somewhere? Uh, one thing I remember when I lived in Berkeley, you know, right on the Hayward Fault by the Memorial Stadium is I always had tennis shoes tied to my bed. So often when there's a shaker, there's glass all over the floor and you're in bed. And so how do you get to the door? And the other thing is to have a crowbar because usually the jams warp. So I'm just trying to bring up a little bit of anecdote to remind us how important it is to think about public safety. And fortunately we haven't had an earthquake. I don't know what the odds are, but that's tomorrow. And then the only other thing is on November 6th, I believe it is, um, that's daylight savings time. Uh, we do our NRG drills. So we have neighborhood response groups and typically every neighborhood has a block captain. Uh, and this is organized for, for, for uh, you know, any shelter in place issue. So that could be a flood, that could be an earthquake. And we've, you know, started thinking a lot more about fires. So you'll see a lot of signs up and, and on daylight savings time at nine or 10 in the morning, people will put these okay signs on your window. So a great thing for those of you listening, those of you here is just to know that that's there. And, you know, the more you participate, think about neighbors who are elderly, who may not know and who are more at risk. And it's another way to keep our community safe. So I invite you to think about the shakeout drill and the NRG drills. Um, and that's it for me. Um, so from with that, our next item is public hearings, which we have none. So now we can move to what I think most of you are here for, our business items. And we have uh, 8.1, which is the options to regulate residential rent increases. And um, I wanted to uh, first um, ask if uh, we have a staff report on that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, uh, council members. Uh, as you'll note, I gave you just a very brief summary for this staff report and then attached the research from the prior one. Uh, your staff's been very focused in reaching out to agencies that have rent stabilization or rent review or some other form of rent regulation to better understand the real world application of those ordinances. We've had a particular focus on agencies that have adopted those ordinances in the last few years to get a sense of what the startup process looks like and costs. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll have sufficient breadth of investigation in that area to be able to inform the ad hoc committee and or the council here in the next week or two. Um, what we have been hearing that we probably undervalued in terms of time and, and staff uh, cost is the development of a rental registry. We're hearing time and again, that's a, a fairly intensive matter. It's not a simple thing. So um, that's not to say it can't be done. I'm just suggesting, I think I've been a little uh, light in terms of thinking that that was something that was fairly administratively straightforward. Um, it, what I'm hearing uh, through channels is there's a lot of staff time invested in following up and making sure that landlords are registering all their units um, and different cities have different approaches to solving that challenge. We're also trying to talk to some cities that have outsourced a lot of this to third parties. Um, there are several nonprofits that uh, offer third party support for rent regulation. So we're trying to get that perspective too, not just what an internal operation looks like so that we can give you that, that those different models when and if you come to the point that you wanna have that particular discussion. Um, I also just want to acknowledge, and I suspect that the ad hoc committee may speak a little more about this, but um, we had what I thought was a very uh, good turnout and participation on Monday for a forum uh, where 
we targeted and invited the property owner landlord community to come speak to the ad hoc um, committee and the public. And uh, I think we got a lot of thoughtful feedback from uh, that perspective that I suspect, uh, I know it informed me in a couple of areas in particular, and I suspect the ad hoc committee will have comments about that as well. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Great, thank you, Dan. Okay, so uh, what I thought we would do tonight is um, is start with public comment. Uh, as you all know, we've had lots of public comment and um, many of you may be more interested in, in what direction we're moving. So we'd like to do that as well. But um, for the public comment portion, um, I would request that we shorten the time given that that on record and you know uh, the other members here, we've heard so much. So we're thinking of limiting it to one minute. Um, and if you really feel like you have something that's new, I, I you know want to be flexible, but I also want to manage the time well tonight. Uh, after that, um, we'd like to turn it to the council to kind of see what the thoughts are. Uh, uh, Councilmember Harif and myself can report out. We did have the meeting with the um, the owners, and it was very informative. I took a lot of notes there too, and a couple of comments I want to make. Uh, we do still intend to meet with uh, or have a meeting between Prime and the uh, Skylark Tenants Association, and uh, we do have some ideas for what direction to take now. Um, so we'll bring it back uh, to the council for that. But let's start off with um, public comment. Anybody here who wants to speak, let's you know limit it to one minute. If you really feel you have something new and a lot more to say, please, I'm open. I don't want to be. Uh, you know, um, you know, shutting down any important information, but I do want us to be efficient. So uh, uh, do we have anybody else in, in the chambers? And if you would just come up to the mic, state your name and where you live, and I will use this contraption here to time you. Hi, um, Joan Weinberg at Skylark. And hi, Joan. Hi, I've spoken before this time. I have notes, but maybe a little longer than a minute. So. Um, when I moved into Skylark in 1993, I paid $1,000 a month for a two bedroom, one bath apartment. There was no state rent increase cap for much of the time that I lived there. Pell gave uh, the owners, the previous owners, Pell gave only intermittent increases, maybe a few years in a row, 25, 50, $75. It took 30 years to get to my current June rent before my increase. Um, if Prime owned the complex sooner and increased the rent by 10% every year, which is their current intent, my rent would have reached the same $2,325 within nine years, not 30 years. And I'm going to give this all to you. Yeah. So, um, when I had a roommate, I could pay the increase. Now I don't have one. I'm on a fixed income. And um, every year getting a 10% increase or any year getting a 10% increase will probably push me out. Where I would go, I don't know. I will admit that Prime's fund has helped me. They heard that some of us are living in Skylark in a low income status. I never thought I lived in low income status, but I am. My rent was lowered by 15% to 2150. So it's a little bit under what it had been before the increase. So I just wanna say also, um, I listened to the landlord meeting. Yeah. And I see that there are individuals and small mom and pop owners who are compassionate and understanding of their renters' individual situations. I understand their positions. They are obviously separate and distinct from what investment groups are all about. The investment group, these large businesses buying into Larkspur, will be turning Larkspur into a smaller San Francisco, except without the rent control that San Francisco has. I lived in San Francisco for 20 years, but the many changes and further upscaling that has happened there is not for Larkspur. 
So perhaps there can be a cutoff point for the number of individual units the smaller owners can have before they are regulated by our, our rent cap. Using real estate as a 401k, as one speaker mentioned, and what goes along with that is very different from the investors who will be reaping the rewards from the back of us tenants. It, it is important for you all to know that in the 30 years, sorry, I lived in Skylark, there was never a need for a tenants association, never. Concerning rents, Pell never gave us a reason to create one. All ran smoothly as far as rent was concerned and other things. As soon as Prime took over, the need for a tenants group surged. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Joe. Okay. So we went over three minutes, but I, I do appreciate your comments. That's okay. No, I, I want to thank you for disclosing some of the financial details and, and you know, and taking the risk to speak. Kevin. Yeah. And uh, I, Kevin, can I be strict with you? <laughs> I think I'll get it. Okay. Uh, most of what I said, I said in my, my, my fellow council members are going to kick me off if I don't do better. <laughs> but this is what has occurred to me in the meantime. Okay. Four o'clock this but afternoon. I will acknowledge you submitted two letters that we felt we yeah. had a chance to read. They're on the public comment already. Yeah. Um, my job involves a lot of talking with people, being a cab driver. People love to talk. But what they love to talk about are their successes. People don't like to talk about their mistakes or their failures. So I hear all the great deals that have been made financially and otherwise. And as a society, we just don't do that. The renters for all these meetings since last February when this started have laid bare their financial difficulties. They've been honest with you. They've told you they have had to leave. Some have already left. Some are planning on leaving and some will have to leave at whatever point the next rent increases come in the early part of next year. That's very difficult for people to talk about. Will the landlords do the same? Will they show you their profit and loss statements? Will they show you the facts about their financial situation? Most of their talk Monday night was about their fears, fears of what might happen if you impose rent stabilization. What these people have been telling you is the nightmare of what they are living right now. These are facts. One other thing I was struck about Monday night was the landlord who talked about owning rental property in both San Francisco and Marin. And what a nightmare, nightmare that the property in San Francisco is. And my only thought was, if it's so bad, why hasn't he sold that property? If he doesn't expect to make a profit now or in the future, why is he hanging on to it? There must be a reason why. And in America, that's usually a profit motive. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Mr. Vice Mayor. Yes. You may want to ask for decorum in the chamber after each speaker. Oh, okay. So, yes. Good point. Yeah. If we can withhold the applause, we're really trying to get information. I understand the emotions though, but uh, we'll just nod our heads maybe in acknowledgement. Next speaker, please. Hi, uh, my name is Abby Laporte. I'm a tenant um, uh, near Lexford Landing. And I think that a strong annual cap on rent, like serious rent control is really important to this com community. And I think it's a really good move in a variety of ways, including for uh, the people who represent our constituents for the city council and, and also just cause eviction protections I think are relevant and important for our community. Um, I'm going to try to keep it brief, but, you know, we are in the Bay Area. We know what's happening. I think constant turnover of renters because people are getting pushed out because of rent increases is problematic. It's unhealthy for the community, and it's not a good reflection of the governance when they allow that to happen. Um, I believe that you guys kind of as individuals really understand the magnitude and depth of the issue of we need really, really strong rent control. We need it to be a sustainable and healthy place for people to continue living as individuals, as people, um, you know, underserved populations. I 
definitely understand like the neurodiverse community, single people, elderly people, um, students even to an extent. Um, I'm in graduate school at Dominican University. I think a lot of um, I'm actually late to a comedy open mic, and I think a lot of people that are artists, that are creators, that are um, doing really good work, even in science and things, like, there, there are very real um, contributions that we're making to this community by being able to stay here for longer periods of time due to strong annual cap on, on rent protections and just cause uh, protection for, for us to not get evicted. Thank you guys so much for your Great. time. Thank you. Hey, hang on. Before you, before you leave, can I ask you a question? Um, being that you're not, you know, most of the people we've heard from are in the Skylar group. Have you also had a rent increase, you know, eight to 10% over the last year or something like that? So I am at Serenity and I really, really don't want my rent to go up. I don't know that I could stay. And I know that I'm a good member of the community. And I think that the longer people are there. So I don't know. I'm so like you really haven't had a rent, con- rent Well, I haven't been yet. there a year yet. Got so it. they're probably, yes, but I don't know. So okay. I don't have the data, but I'm trying to avoid that by being here tonight. So thank you guys. I want to stay. Hey, thank you. Do you want to come up? Can, can I ask you to yeah. come up and yeah, maybe tell us who you are and make it public? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Elsa, next public comment. Good evening. Thank you for um, having me again. Um, Tonight, I brought my daughter with me, Aubrey Ellis, for a couple of reasons. Um, One, to show firsthand that those of us that come up here and speak, there is family behind us. There's loved ones behind us. There's friends behind us that when our lives are impacted, those lives are impacted. And you guys have heard my story. I moved to Skylark when I was pregnant with her. She's grown up there. And while I promised to not make her speak, I did ask her two simple questions when we're driving down here. And I said, what is um, your favorite thing about living in Skylark? And she said all the memories that she has there. And I asked her what her favorite thing about living in the city of Larkspur is. And she said how safe it is. And This is coming from a child whose life is about to be impacted. Um, The second reason I brought her her here today was to be an example that no matter how small or insignificant you might feel, that you can and should use your voice to stand up for what you feel is a right cause. And I hope that I'm being an example to her today. Um, Prime is the big guy in this conversation, we do feel small sometimes. The residents of Skylark and the residents of Larkspur and Marin County in general, sometimes we feel small when we're going up against big corporations like Prime. They have the deep pockets to hire these highly compensated litigation attorneys. They tout around our apartment complex in their nice suits all day long, talking about who knows what, how they're going to you know, impact our day-to-day life. And we are all witnessing that. And yes, sometimes we feel very small and it takes a lot of courage for us to come here time and time again and continue to speak. And I just feel like if we backtrack on this process at all, we're letting the big guy again have the upper hand over the little guy. And I don't want to see that in large spur. Um, I know that Prime also made the comment last week or two weeks ago that they are invested in the community. And I'd be curious to know what that means to them because my understanding is yes, they're a property taxpayer, but in what other ways are they truly invested in this community the way that we are invested in this community? What are they doing for small businesses? Are they sourcing their service needs from local vendors? Are they supporting our restaurants, our local shops, are they doing any of that? I don't think so, because I don't think that's their interest. Their interest is their investors. And if anybody knows investment in this community better, it's you guys. You guys are public servants and that's what you do. You're invested, you care about the community, you care about the city. Prime does not care about this city. So that's all I have to say this evening. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you for your courage and your daughter has a lot to be proud of. Next speaker. Yes, please. Sorry. Good evening. Thank you for listening to our comments. My name is Judith Shiner, and I've been at Skylark for 15 years after leaving San Francisco, which was under uh, rent control, blessedly. Um, I'm 81, and um, my Social Security is almost $1,000. And my rent now is 2,339. It went up $189 a month. And so I, I hope that this wasn't related, but I actually had a, a TIA. I had a small mini stroke. Uh, I, don't, I do know that financial stress uh, affects my body. And um, I'm a, a, a very uh, loving, contemplative person. And I really envision staying in Skylark the whole time I, I'm on the planet. And um, um, oh, I knew there was something important to say. So I've been using my savings a lot every month to pay my rent. And 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 with the stock market going down, I my savings are 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 very minimal right now, which is putting more stress on me. And so I, I really sincerely and hopefully ask you to enact rent control so that at least there can be some stability in knowing that I'm not going to get a, such a huge, huge raise. Can I ask you if you've reached out for the rental assistance program that uh, Skylark Management is doing? I have not yet. Are you um, familiar with it? No, I'm not familiar okay. with it. Um, but I, I will check into that. Yeah. Great. Uh, and so, and so thank, thank you very, very much. And, and I have friends and neighbors. And so there's a real, it feels like there's a real community, like two of the other women uh, came here with me tonight that live in Skylark. And, and uh, I think women are being affected more um, by this issue. And so I'd like that to be taken into account as well. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Judith. Okay, so I have to level with you people. We're not doing one minute. <laughs> and I don't want to. I, I really don't want to cut these these things off. I mean, you know, new information or not, I'd like to ask my fellow council members if it's okay if we just do what we're doing. I don't want to cut people off. This is too important. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, it just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a lot of moral pressure on them because I, I, you know, if we have a process, we should stick to it. And I, we came in knowing that, that, you know, we want to be efficient, but I, I really have to listen to my heart. I mean, these are important things you want to say, and we're here to listen. So, uh... but I think we need to honor also that we've had lots of conversation and a lot of speakers, some are new, like this, this woman tonight is new. So, mm -hmm. I mean, your information was something we hadn't heard before, but I would just like everyone to understand that we take our jobs very seriously and we do read and we do see everything and repeating it um, now is, is probably not as an effective, an efficient way for us to deliberate. So um, I just guarantee you that we pay attention to everything that comes in. So we okay. don't. Yeah, that's fair enough. So we're, you understand we're trying to still keep it brief. Um, Scott, did you have a thought? <laughs> no. Kevin, okay, so let's uh, keep going. And again, we'd like to move back to the council once we've heard from everyone. Hi, my name is Nadia Floyd. I live in the Skylark Apartments and I've lived there for 23 years and I've really enjoyed living there and I expect rental raises, but I'm on disability and I only get a certain amount of money. So um, it doesn't go as far. I only get a 3% cost of living raise for a while and at a 10% increase I can uh, on the rent, I can only see myself moving out. It's, just, it's not sustainable. And this is where I live and I don't know where else I, I'm going. I really don't. I love this community. I've lived here for years, not even just the Skylark apartment, but in other places in Larkspur. And I'm just, I'm beside myself and what I'm supposed to do. 
uh, I just can't work anymore. I'm also disabled. And just as a thing I want to bring up, um, it took me a long time as a person who just had a surgery and now is disabled. I had a hard time getting a, a parking spot near my apartment and I had to maneuver stairs for months on end with groceries and books and everything. And I'm an educator and I, I don't see educators salaries going up that much. Can I ask you if you've been able to reach out with to Prime for their rental assistance program? I have, and they haven't gotten back to me. Okay, so there's still an opportunity for that to happen for you. I'm hoping. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Nadia. Uh, yeah, next speaker. Hello, I'm Elaine from Skylark. There's two things I'd like to address what Judith mentioned. I'm not sure why she said this could be affecting women more, but what struck me is women don't make as much. So the burden of rent is that much more difficult for women. I'd also like to say to my other neighbor, I hope she can apply for the financial aid, but I'm not sure if you're receiving disability, you may not qualify. So um, good luck. It may not happen if you're receiving other assistance. But if I recall, when you spoke last time, you were able to take advantage of that program. Yes, I have. Okay, thank but you. I, but I have no disability. Yes, I understand. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Thanks, Elaine. Okay, uh, next speaker. Should we take people from the yeah, I was going to do the chamber first. Hi, Vice Mayor Paulson hi, and hi, Council members. I am I allowed to ask questions before I start my public comment? It's just a question for each of you. We're kind of winging it here. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to know if I, any of you renters or do you all own your property? And this is for each of you. I'm not a renter. Okay. Yeah, yeah I've, I've rented almost my entire life and recently became a homeowner. Okay. And I, I'm in the same boat as that as well. You you own your property? Yeah, I've rented for a long time. Oh, and then I'm you just a, now I'm a homeowner. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And Council Member Haroff, if I may. Yes, I'm a long time homeowner. I'm a homeowner. Okay. Thank you. I, I was just asking this because um, I realized as I was thinking about you as individual people, because we've gotten to know each other a little bit over the last few weeks, is that I didn't I didn't know if you rent or you you owned your home. So um, because I I wanted to just invoke on you to just put yourself back to when you were renting. Um, Council member Wade, the reason why we come here every week and talk about this every two weeks is because we live it every week. So we can't turn it off and say, oh, you know what? The comments I made two weeks ago or three weeks ago are not relevant because every week we live this. It is, it is as much as you wake up in the morning, we can't turn it off. We, we don't have stabilization. So when people come up here and, and say their stories, I think it's okay to listen to them. I'm listening. I, I know, but it, it, even if they said it again, give them an opportunity to talk again. Because for us, it's real. It happens every day. Every day you wake up, you don't know what your rent is going to be. Every day you wake up, it's a burden. So that's all I was, I was going to say. But um, if I may, I'm going to speak on behalf of the Skylark Tenants Association, and I just have a quick read. Um, and I practiced it. I promise you it will be less than four minutes, if that's OK. Um, I just want to thank you council members and the ad hoc committee for continuing to treat this issue with urgency. Um, I said this two weeks ago, but we'll start with an issue that we can all be in agreement on. One is that housing is a necessity and that broadly speaking, it is under threat in Larkspur due to high rents. As you're aware, we have been canvassing our community with a petition urging elected officials such as yourself to pass rent control in Larkspur. So far, we have about 300 of those petitions signed, 218 of them from, from renters, and about 25 are from homeowners. As we met our neighbors, uh, you're going to hear from some of them here, we realized that sadly, the situation at Skylark was not unique. Renters all over Larkspur are receiving absurdly high rent increases. Most of these renters we spoke to were rent burdened and were seriously considering moving out of Larkspur as they, can, as they couldn't absorb another rent raise. 
I just wanted to point out that about half of lakhs per resident are renters, that's 6,000 of us. And only about 1,200 of those actually live in really large complexes. So the others live in fairly smaller complexes. And I think from what the city manager has said, it's about 75 properties that are in question. So about half of lakhs per renters are rent burdened. This means that they pay more than 30% of their income on rent. That's about 3,000 people. So, and while the other half of, 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 the, of the, um, the other half is not rent burdened, a 10% increase, rent increase, or an 8.8% rent increase is simply not one that any household can absorb. So our conclusion was this, that lax renters desperately need basic protections against, against skyrocketing rent and arbitrary evictions. All renters deserve protections. All renters deserve housing security. It doesn't matter who their landlord is, what the size of their complex is, or whether they happen to live in Skylark, Woodlark, Serenity, or a smaller mom and pop complex. This is why we need to create an universal policy that protects everyone. As a city council op op explores options for rent stabilization, we ask that you consider an annual rent increase ceiling of 60% of CPI and 5% or 5%, whichever is lower. This is a hybrid standard that links annual rent increases to a percentage of CPI in regular inflation years, while providing a fixed upper limit during high inflation years, such as the year that we're in right now. Most jurisdictions across the state with rent stabilizations tie their maximum annual rent increases to a percentage of CPI and then add, an up, add on an upper bound to protect against high inflation years. Adopting a weaker standard may undermine the very purpose of the regulation, which is to ensure fair and manageable rent increases for both tenants and landlords. And um, of note to you, City Council, and I know the city manager also put this in the packet, is that Fairfax has just provided a model. Last week, uh, the City Council unanimously approved ordinances that would both establish rent as that would both establish rent stabilization and strengthen existing just cost eviction protections. Fairfax, to be noted, is half the size of Laxper, with about one third as many renters, and it has a far smaller staff. If they can figure out a way to provide those protections, we believe so, so can Laxper. We also understand that Mayor Stephanie Hellman and Mayor and, and Vice Mayor Chance Cutrano are, mo, are more than willing to act as resources for Laxper and that they are interested in exploring a shared services model for administrations of ordinances if other marine jurisdictions such as Laxper uh, were to pass similar policies. And in tandem with the rent stabilization, we need local just cause evictions as, as had, has been called out. And we need just cause eviction protections that exceed those provided in the Tenant Protection Act. Um, and that we need uh, the, tenant the Tenant Protection Act, as you know, is riddled with loopholes that allow landlords to evict tenants through no fault evictions. So we need stronger local protections that include provisions such as right of return, uh, relocation payments, Ellis Act re-rental regulations, demolition restrictions, and extra protections for the vulnerable, such as some of who you've heard from here, uh, uh, vulnerable protections such as seniors, people with disabilities, and terminally ill. In closing, City Council, I urge you, and we urge you as Skylark Tenants Association, and really just as um, tenants and, and renters in Laxper, to direct staff to advance a rent to advance a rent stabilization ordinance that will do two things: one, meet the goal of truly protecting Laxper renters, and two, provide real housing security for half of Laxper's population, and that is six thousand people who I think matter and who deserve to live in this community and have st and have stable rents and stable housing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Njoki. Okay, uh, Alison, do we have any other public comment? Um, I'll try to keep it down to a minute. My plan was basically to uh, not say anything that's already been said before. And I sure. hope I What's your name, that. sir? Hi, my name's Keith. Okay, Keith. Um, I don't Welcome. live in Skylark, so I see this is, for some people here, this is like an emergency meeting and a session. We have to take care of this right away. So I'm gonna speak a little more globally about what's going on because five years ago, I was involved in something very similar to this because 
landlords tend to win and that's usually how these things go. And I was in San Rafael and I had to move to Larkspur because my rent went up 50% in a three year period. Um, it was sort of new, large, doesn't matter where it was and such, but it was in San Rafael. And it's something that I think is uh, not uncommon. It's kind of a way to forcibly evict people without actually being an eviction. It kind of gets around stuff by raising rents up using the term markets, you know, it's the market rate. Um, and it's not invalid, unfortunately. I, I understand it. But um, what I want to tell them more in a global sense is what we're losing here of all the rents increasing so quickly is that there's going to be no affordable housing anymore in the area. And I've seen this happen in other places where what happens is you have a doctor, but they can't have a nurse work for them anymore. You have a nice school, but suddenly teachers are moving. They say, well, I can't afford to live here, so I'm going to move to this town 20 miles away just so I can afford rent but they're like why am i teaching all the way down there when i can get paid the same thing to teach up here you start to lose everything happens now something that the county of marin did about five years ago was they tried to do um a uh, mandatory mediation are you guys familiar with that mm -hmm, sure. and i don't know if this larkspur has looked into it or tried to do it or anything like that and it's it's a nice stopgap because the goal there is not so much if you say we're going to cap rents, that's a problem. And understand we're pushed back as it's just plain rent control. Because I know the arguments against rent control, and some of them are sort of valid where there's a history of it not helping enough people and just some rents go up and people are trapped. But generally speaking, the goal is to stop um, rapid increases of rent like mine was. Because people, even, even though I could afford it at the time in a sense, nobody budgets for 50% increase in rent. That's just, that's never been done. It's never going to be done. People reach into savings. They decide I'm going to move, et cetera. When you have people who move quickly because they can get new people in, what you lose is long-term tenants. I think long-term tenants is what Larchborough wants to be about. People who've lived here a while are going to care more, show up to meetings, care about the, the culture, the cities, environment, all that kind of stuff, more than people who are sort of passing through just to moved in because this is my stopgap before I can afford a place to live and so forth in the city or something like that. Um, something not spoken about here, too, because no one can ever admit it. One of the reasons landlords can jack the rents up so high is because they're getting it. And how they're getting it is because, and again, you know, no one will ever admit this, you have two bedroom apartments with two families living in them. And I mean, like with children in each bedroom and stuff with the parents. You have one bedroom units where you have someone living in the living room couch and someone like a girlfriend in the bedroom and such. That happens all over the place, which of course you can just say, well, that adds to parking problems and such, but that's kind of why they're getting it. And there's some also some rare stories of people who like live in an apartment and they rent it out for Airbnb once a week for the month to pay for the month's rent while they go sleep on someone else's couch or something. But that's, I know that's a rarity, but I've heard people give those kind of stories and such. Um, so basically, it's also uh, da, 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 basically excessively high rent increases, you know, disrupt lives. Because as you hear from people like, I've got to move, I got to find something to do. This is really serious. There's when you have kind of the rent can't increase so much from month to month or from year to year, et cetera, that just kind of is a stabilizing force because no one's salary is going up as much as the rents are going and such that they're getting. Um, also, it's, um, uh, I can't bring up the statement, but people, Keith, say Keith, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you kind of come to the points? I, I, I know you've said sorry. a lot of I'm things so far. I'm trying not to cover stuff. Other people said and stuff. So I'm jumping between the points. Basically it's just, um, things like with the fixed income, elderly people will have nowhere to go. And that's just, that's obviously a big problem. People brought that up and such. If they have some sort of planning, if the rents can't increase, by so much each year, because even 5% is more than anyone's salary and certain jobs are never going to go up that high. The people who work, bus boys, restaurant, things like that and such. So it's just basically, um, I'm just bringing up the point that um, if you we want to find a way to basically slow down the rapid rent increases. It's just, uh, I know it's things like rent control sounds bad, the mandatory mediation, well, not very, I didn't have any teeth to it. It's at least the right start. So that's something like what's happening at Skylark, which is going to completely uproot the whole place isn't gonna be happening at the next place, the next place, the next place. We really, I can't think of a place of what I call low-income housing in, in Larchborough right now. I don't even think Skylark was really that to begin with, but there's nowhere, most communities and cities will have somewhere that people who can't quite, you know, who are blue collar, low income, et cetera, can live. We wanna at some point protect a place, so we have that. 
Right. Hopefully nothing I added here is something that's been covered just recently. Before. Yeah, no, I think you said a lot of things, but I appreciate the comments, Keith. All right. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, Allison, do we have anyone in the queue? Oh, it looks like we have quite a few raised hands. I didn't see that. Um, so maybe we'll just move to Zoom. And I, I think I, I didn't realize I, I thought it might be five people. I, I think I do need to start enforcing the time now. So um, let's go ahead and, and take our next uh, next person on Zoom. Our next person will be Tristan. All right. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you uh, for listening again. I Mine's quick, but I think I might go just over the minute. So um, hopefully you can let me do that. Um, good evening, Vice Mayor Paulson and members of the council. Uh, my comment today is centered around an article published in ProPublica uh, earlier this week called Rent Going Up, One Company's Algorithm Could Be Why. This algorithm uh, is called Yieldstar. Uh, it's owned by a company called RealPage, and it's used to calculate the rents on almost 20 million units in the United States. It uses a nationwide database of actual lease data to extract the most amount of profit from renters, whether that's new residents or renewed leases. The more data that gets added to this database, the more corporate managers the, use the software to calculate the rent, the more the bargaining position of the tenant disappears completely and the rental market separates even further from reality. In some cities, entire neighborhoods are dominated by landlords who use the same pricing software. Not only is this basically price fixing with extra steps, this results in a feedback loop where rents go up because rents go up. And this is exactly what is happening here as Prime is a known customer of RealPage. I highly recommend everyone read the entire article, but I'd like to share some quotes. One of the algorithm's developers told ProPublica that leasing agents had too much empathy compared to computer-generated pricing. Find out how Yieldstar can help you outperform the market three to 7%, RealPage urges potential clients on its website. Unimpeded by human worries, Yieldstar's price increases led to more tenants leaving. An apartment complex's turnover rates increased about 15 percentage points in 2006 after it implemented Yieldstar. But that wasn't a problem for the firm. Despite having to replace more tenants, its revenue grew by more than 7%. Tristan, Tristan um, I, I hate to cut you off. I, I, you did submit this article, didn't you, for public comment? I sent it to you. I, I missed it. Yeah. Oh, you didn't send it publicly, but I maybe just more, to another more. few more seconds. I, I think I get the point. There's an algorithm, but if you can just conclude, that'd be the great. net effect of driving revenue and pushing people out was 10 million in income. I think this shows that keeping heads in beds above all else is not always the best strategy. That this sort of algorithm is antithetical to a healthy community in a town where half of us is renters. If users of Yieldstar hit a critical mass, Yieldstar sets the market rate. And with how much they have, how quickly they are growing, they'll be sooner than you think. The city of Larkspur needs to step in and protect its residents from predatory corporations who have no issues blatantly prioritizing profit over liv livability, churn over tenure, and quarterly returns over anything that might lead to a healthy and vibrant community. Okay, great. Thanks, Tristan. And you may want to send that. I did read your article. I think it was great. You might want to send that in to Allison for public comment. Uh, next speaker, please. The next speaker will be Leslie W. Uh, go ahead. Welcome, Leslie. And Leslie, I'll ask you to unmute. I'm not seeing Leslie unmuting. I'll move to the next speaker. We'll hear from Meg. Okay, I'll come back to Leslie. Okay, uh, welcome, Meg. Hi, this is Meg. Um, real quick, I am a renderer up at Skylark, but that wasn't actually the reason I joined. Um, and um, I am, a, I really truly believe that we should have rent control in Larkspur. I do think because Fairfax came in with it, I've got a special needs kid who's at Redwood. I'm a substitute teacher in the district and in Larkspur and Larkspur doesn't pay the highest in the district, by the way. Um, my son is a fireman for Marin, the Marin crew. We are community members and my husband and I work two jobs each to stay here. Um, we've been, a, you know, in the community renting for 13 years. And um, I really do think that rent stabilization for middle class families. And at this point, we may be lower middle class. Amazing considering our degrees, but that's where we are. Um, really keeps the community together because my son works at Lucky's, my little one. You know, we're part of the community. 
So anyways, that's my two cents. Hope I kept it under a minute. You did great, Meg. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker, please. Next, we'll hear from Chance Cutrano. Hey, Chance. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Paulson and Council Members. Chance Catrano, Vice Mayor of Fairfax. Uh, no need for me to advocate on anything tonight, but I just wanted to do a courtesy call. Um, a couple folks have alluded to the fact that Fairfax did have its first reading of uh, strengthening of just cause ordinance and the rent stabilization ordinance. But I just wanted to also really shout out um, what town manager Schwartz mentioned about the rental registry. That will be the, the biggest hurdle for us in terms of implementation of this as we move forward in Fairfax. Basically, uh, on a cost basis, um, of course, you know, there's a lot of outreach that has to be done with landlords, but um, and tenants as well. So everyone knows their rights and their responsibilities. But um, I just wanted to, to shout that out, because that's something that we are trying to figure out. And we would love to partner with you all to figure out how that would work. I've also been in discussions with philanthropic institutions that are definitely interested in figuring out how we protect affordable housing and slow the acceleration uh, uh, in this sort of frothy environment we find ourselves in with our housing stock. Um, so, you know, again, the shared services model is something to look into. There could be philanthropic dollars to add to the capital stack to help us figure out how to do this in the interim, but just wanted to flag this and um, you know, thank you all for considering this and it'll be really interesting to hear your deliberations. Take care. Great, thank you, Chance. Yeah, and thanks for clarification. It's not that the ordinance was passed, just the first reading. Uh, next comment, please. Next, next speaker will be James Holmes. Welcome, James. Uh, James Holmes. Uh, I just wonder if thought has been given to uh, establishing a threshold size or number of units to which rent control would apply, e.g five units, 10 units, et cetera. Um, and most important, would that be legal? But if it is legal, there certainly would be a rational basis for making that kind of a, uh, a differentiation because uh, those larger complexes seem to be the type that uh, attract, the, attract the larger uh, investors and the larger uh, algorithms and so on. And also uh, the larger um, investors and landlords are more able to deal with uh, the complexities of rent control and uh, the um, uh, registry um, administration problems would be less if, if the larger complexes were focused on. So if it's possible to focus on the larger complexes, that might be a, a possibility. Thanks. Great. Thank you for your comment, James. Um, the next uh, speaker, please, Allison. Next, we'll hear from Dorothy O'Leary. Welcome, Dorothy. Hi, are you able to hear me? I am. We are. Okay. Uh, I know you've heard from me before. I'll try to make sure I'm giving you new information. I want to share with you um, that I, um, in the past few months, have received two different letters from Prime and um, I live at Skylark. Um, one I received at the end of July telling me uh, that it was time to sign a new lease. I already have a lease with Skylark Apartments, so it wasn't time for me to sign any new lease. Uh, they gave me the option to sign a new lease and pay $2,793 or to continue to extend my current lease and then I'd only have to pay $2,695. They gave me a $2 break per month for signing a new lease with them. Um, is really absurd. I've also, I also understand that Prime has presented to you guys that they uh, have not Im, uh, imposed a full 10% rent increase to many of the Skylark residents. And I'm assuming it's based on this $2 a month differentiation. A month later, they did send out a letter telling me that um, regardless of what I wanted to do, I only needed to pay uh, the 200 $2,693, so they're giving me a $2 a month rent break. Um, I don't consider that uh, particularly helpful because I would like to share the benefit that you've experienced, Vice Mayor Paulson and Council Me Member Kendall. I too would like to be able to save enough money to buy a home someday, and that will not be possible with annual 10% rent increases. 
I signed a lease with Skylark with the expectation that I was signing a lease with an apartment complex that was at the low end of the market rate. Um, that is, was my expectation. I have heard prime representatives come to you and argue that they purchased Skylark with the expectation that they would be able to maximize their profits um, based on what they were allowed to charge us and the rent increases they were allowed to impose annually. They can impose 10% rent increases annually. And doing that will drive me out of Larkspur. Um, so I'm not sure why my expectations are of any less value than prime residential's expectations. Um, rent increases that they are imposing will require me to raise my fee and already are requiring me to raise my fee as a um, private practice practitioner. Um, and this is in fact, the definition of inflation. This is what causes inflation. So I beg of you to please consider uh, the impact on the greater community, not just for me and my private practice, but for every business owner, every person who lives in the community um, and lives as a renter needing to um, continue to get enough money to feed the coffers of large corporations like prime residential. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, yeah, I think we're, we're out of time, but I, I, I do get your point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, next speaker, please. Next will be Stephanie Hellman. Welcome, Stephanie. Stephanie, I'll ask you to unmute. Can you hear me? Mm, yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, just tacking on to the vice mayor in Fairfax, Chance Cutrano, what he shared. As you explore stronger rent protections and rent control in Larkspur, I want to offer that we in Fairfax have been very, very sensitive to the fact that we have small staff and we need to design a program mindful of the resources needed. And as vice mayor Cutrano shared, the registration fee is meant to self-fund the program resources needed. Uh, so I want to encourage you in my, to have a mindset of creativity and how to make this work with the vision for um, really looking at this from the county level. I know that the county draft HCD, or excuse me, the draft housing element that was submitted did include the exploration of rent control for the county. So it will be interesting to see what comes back in terms of the comments back from HCD on that draft. And as the vice mayor shared, um, we would really love to have discussions as you move forward about a shared staffing model. And um, I'm not sure uh, council member Haroff and um, Gabe, um, Mayor Paulson, if you were able to share because of the Brown Act that we had a meeting with you all and if you were able to share resources and what we all um, provided you, if you've been able to share that with full council, but I, I really encourage you to share those, those documents and to talk to Legal Aid of Marin and the leading experts in this domain, Ace and Berkeley, both have been working with us for the better part of a year on a pro bono basis to really design this in the simplest, most supportable way. Um, and finally, I just hope you will consider this as truly anti-displacement housing security policy as we all are grappling with the housing mandates and these draconian um, housing laws. This is an action you can take to actually support local control. These, this is what you can do to protect the residents um, that you have today. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and just a comment, um, a lot of what you did submit uh, is um, available on the Fairfax website and Legal Aid of Marin has sub submitted public comment with much of what we discussed. Uh, next speaker, please. Next we'll hear from Ted Stokely. Hello, I'm actually Heather Steckley using the Zoom. Um, I just want to quickly comment because I did 
uh, read the letter that was sent from Prime, from Kibler, Fowler, and Cave regarding um, their threat of litigation um, should rent control become a reality. Uh, one thing I would like, one, the first thing that struck me about the letter, to be honest, was that they basically plagued the tenants of Skylark as being kind of simpletons who really just don't understand all the things that they're trying to do to help us and that if we would just talk to them, that would, you know, our problems will be solved, um, which is insulting, but it also is not true because this community at Skylark, and I assume most of Larkspur, is comprised of professionals, um, highly educated, you know, individuals who, um, you know, rent for various reasons. But one of the other things that struck me was in paragraph two, where it said, um, and I quote, it is notable that four of the five city council members who currently serve were also city council members in 2020 when the decision was made regarding a um, program for Marin Park. Um, it almost what seemed struck me as a call for the council members to toe the line. And um, it disturbed me because it was followed up really specifically in the next sentence, threatening a multi-million dollar litigation. So um, the issue, and this is why this- oh, Heather, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you can kind of wind down maybe 15 seconds, we're really trying to stick to one minute. Yeah, I, I will. But I also do want to say my piece because I feel as if this call to people to just go to this program that many people don't qualify for is also an insult because the reality is if this if their intentions are true and their expectation that they will be able to raise rent without, you know, prohibition on the part of the tenants every year that everybody who lives here will have to apply for that program. And then that program needs to be the standard rather than the exception. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Alison, who do we have next? Next speaker will be DSA line three. Okay. Hi there. Sorry, I guess I uh, don't have my name on this. Uh, this is Kurt Reese. I am the co-chair of the Marine Chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, and I've been helping to um, lead the campaign to pass rent control across Marin and Fairfax and some of Larks for hopefully as many places as we can, because all renters deserve protections. And that's actually what I want to just use my, my minute to talk about. Um, it's been suggested by uh, a few, uh, I think, council members at different meetings and um, members of the public even, this idea that it might make sense to limit whatever eventually does get passed, hopefully something, of course, gets passed, um, sta rent stabilization, just cause eviction protections to renters who live in larger apartment complexes. And I, I would just want to suggest that this really contradicts basic moral principles that I would guess that we all share. Housing is a basic human necessity. We all need a roof over our heads, a place to call home. Uh, rent stabilization is a policy that simply provides housing security by making future rent increases manageable and predictable, while just cause eviction protections prevent arbitrary eviction. Yet by limiting who qualifies for these policies um, by those limitations already imposed by the state, the council would essentially be taking the position that somehow some renters do not deserve those things, do not deserve a home, housing security, basic protections from displacement. And I think that just makes no sense. Why would the size of your complex determine your access to housing? Um, it seems like the argument is solely based around the conditions of landlords and not renters. And the stakes are just wildly different between these two groups. Landlords, yes, will make a little less profit under rent control, but renters will lose their homes. And a house a home is far more important than a little excess profit. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kurt. Um, next comment, please. Next we'll hear from Scott Jones. Welcome, Scott. Scott, you might want to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, well, many of the arguments about uh, that we've heard tonight are compelling and heart-wrenching about people who are affirmed, who are on fixed income, things like that. I just wanted to uh, raise the point that we shouldn't limit the argument and the, uh, the, the discussion to just those people. There are a vast majority of us who are working, working hard, have full-time jobs and are doing the best we can. We don't qualify for any kind of rent uh, relief. We don't qualify for any kind of other 
uh, social relief. We don't want it. We just want to live where we are. And um, so I just wanted to raise the point that we not to limit our argument and our focus on just these truly heart wrenching uh, stories, but that it affects a lot, a lot of people who are beyond that and are just trying to live day to day. That's all. Thank you. Great, Scott. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Elson, next speaker. Next will be Betsy Russell. Uh, welcome, Betsy. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we okay, can. Okay, great. Um, I just want to piggyback off of uh, the last comment and about three comments ago that it's not just units, <clears throat> excuse me, complexes, apartments, it's all housing in Marin or housing everywhere. But in this area, what we're talking about, it's all housing that needs to have some rent control. And um, that's really all I have to say. I just want to make it short and sweet, but it's, it's all housing that needs rent control. Great, appreciate the comment, Betsy. Thank you. Uh, next comment, please. We'll return to Leslie W. I believe she's worked out her audio issues. <laughs> Welcome, Leslie. We thought you had worked out your audio issues. <laughs> I think you just need to unmute, Leslie, if you can. Uh, while we're waiting for okay. Leslie, oh, okay. Okay. oh, there she is. Me? Okay, go ahead. Yep, okay. we Thank hear you now. Um, I'm so sorry about that. It was having serious problems. Um, I am actually speaking to you on behalf of my neighbor, Hillary Nuri. Uh, she couldn't be here, but she had written some comments and I'm in interest of time going to only read part of it. <clears throat> the part that I think is the most you know, important of her comments. And she was speaking about uh, having, having watched the landlord forum for Monday night. Um, she said, when Will and Elise from Prime spoke, they kept mentioning the re rental assistance program had been established. However, this only consists of 20 residences. The majority of residences of residents that do live here do not qualify as we're just middle class and working hard or retired folks on physical fixed incomes. The first three landlords at least showed compassion to their long-term res residents and showed a nice rapport with them. Do the landlords realize that a 10% increase will become the norm on an annual basis? This is our new reality, which is causing a lot of fear and unsettling feelings and emotions for us, the renters. Are we all? We are all in agreement that Larkspur and Marin County is in desperate need of more housing, which is a given. However, there is not going. That is not going to happen overnight or in a year. We're in a dire straits situation here that needs to be resolved sooner than later. What we need now is a resolution in order for all renters to feel secure, safe, and part of a community. Most importantly, we need to be able to stay in our homes. In the end, what it boils down to is a human, housing is a human right and is a vital human necessity, not just a commodity. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Leslie. Thanks for your patience getting back in the queue. Uh, uh, Alison, do we have anyone else in the uh, Zoom queue? There are no further comments in the Zoom queue. Great. And so I'll just bring it back one more time to the chamber. Anybody else left here who wants to speak? And one minute, please. I think that's a no. Uh, so I appreciate everyone's comment. And I, I do apologize if anybody felt cut off. I, I hope you realize we're trying to strike a balance here. Um, but I, I, I feel informed. I do think there was a lot of new information and um, you know I want you to all know we are thinking about this. We spent a lot of time, I have at least personally. So I want to bring it back to the council and maybe open it up to uh, any of the council members who'd like to make comments. Um, as the ad hoc committee, uh, Kevin, um, council member Haroff and myself uh, could, could do a brief report out first, if that's better. So um, it sounds like that's a nod. Uh, Kevin, do you want to start or would you, you, you go? You go ahead, Gabe. Okay, great. So uh, I just briefly wanted to report out, it sounds like many of you did attend the, the meetings uh, that we, the last meeting was the landlord or the um, property owner forum and uh, about 16 attendees. And um, 
It was also really good to get perspectives. We did have the, the Bonaire, which is a large holder, and we had some very small holders, you know, who had a few units. Um, and, and it really, I think it helped to, for me personally, to kind of start to see some of the parameters of the discussion. So we've heard a lot from Skylark, we've heard from renters. Um, for me, uh, I, I, you know, I'll go a little bit editorial for 30 seconds. I'm still coming back to the question of fairness. Uh, what is fair? You know, housing is, is something that we do really want people to feel a security around at the same time. Uh, you know, for some people, these houses are their 401k. Uh, for many of us, we don't understand, you know, it, it sounds like there's very large corporations at work, but they're a majority of smaller owners and what financial constraints they're under, how this might impact them, we're still trying to learn. Um, and then there's also just the city and staff. Uh, you heard both um, of the, the mayor and vice mayor of uh, Fairfax reach out to us in the meeting tonight saying that, hey, this is a stretch, you know, we, we are looking at shared services. And that's something that we're keenly aware of, you know, what this might do to our property tax base, what this might do to our legal exposure of liability, what costs, what staffing, where this works. And part of what I thought last meeting was that in the discussion of fairness, I, it's just good for the people who are on the landowner side to think, what is it like to live with insecurity? And for people on the you know, other side who are renters to think, what is it like to put your capital at risk? And it's not always just less profit. It could be a lot more constraints. If you have a bad tenant, you know, can you get them out? You know, what do these laws do? So anyway, that's my editorial I've been thinking about. But uh, back to constructive steps, uh, we want to um, have the meeting between Prime and the uh, Skylark Tenant Association. We think this is important in the discussion, whatever the outcome. Uh, we want to continue working with staff. We have a few uh, recommendations we're going to make at the end of this. But with that, um, Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, not, not really too much. Um, you know, this, this, this whole process has been a learning exercise for me. Um, um, I've kind of expressed my own personal views about what an appropriate outcome might be. Um, I haven't really changed those views, but I recognize that we still need more work to do. And I think that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, may take a little bit longer than some may be happy about, um, but we need to do our due diligence and I'm comfortable with that. Um, but again, I, my, my fundamental view on this has not changed. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Council Member Way, Council Member Candell, any questions, thoughts? Sorry, <laughs> I, I just, um, I think you articulated it very well where we are at this point, um, and I appreciate the comments that we've heard um, spoken to us and also a lot of written comments. Um, the um, information to me is very, it's dense and there still needs to be more information gathered um, that we learned on Monday from um, the forum in which the property owners could speak that they had a lot of questions too as to how this would implicate them. Um, not just uh, the larger complexes, but the ones who may have 20 units or may have five units that have long time residents here in Larksburg and they live here too. So um, I'm confident that you're continuing to do your the due diligence and on our staff is too. Um, this is a huge uh, policy change that can't happen overnight. So um, I think that one of the callers referenced uh, a letter that we received um, and I think that's important uh, information that we need to, uh, from Kibler, Fowler, and Claire, more information we need to learn about too. So I think we're on the right track, but we're not uh, there yet. Scott. Um, thank you everyone for I know some people come out come out here every two weeks, and um, it's a lot of time, and we appreciate it. Uh, it really does give us perspective, uh, hearing from everybody from all all different uh, places that you're coming from. Uh, I personally um, think that letter from the attorney I am not concerned about. 
Uh, I think we as the city have the authority to do rent control if we want to. Anybody could sue anybody, but if they sue us, they, in my opinion, they're going to lose because I don't think we're doing anything wrong. I think we have a very competent city attorney who would draft a very competent ordinance that would withstand a legal challenge. So that that's not really my issue. Um, my issue, like like Gabe's, is fairness. You know, there are two sides of the coin, and and yes, housing is a right, but you know, do you have a right to live anywhere you want for you know a rent that you think is fair, but may not is under market, and it's complicated, and 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 landlords do there there are lots of different potential solutions. Um, what I would like to explore, and we have uh, a. Uh, uh, a subcommittee that's that's looking at rent control uh, as a possible solution to this. Um, I would like to explore rental assistance as another possible solution. Is it something that either you know the the owners would you know kick in to uh, make it more palatable for tenants on a, a need basis? Uh, there's some people that really need rental assistance, and there are some people that don't. You know, and that may be a factor that should be important for us. You know, there may be renters that are very wealthy and rent, to, you know, it, rent control shouldn't should apply to them. You know, there, there may be a group of people who rent control should apply to. Uh, and I would like to explore that. So uh, while we go forward with the uh, potential rent control. And, and I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day here, we're going to ask staff to continue uh, exploring our rent control options uh, and, you know, potential steps forward on that path. Uh, I am going to request to the uh, vice mayor that we also set up a subcommittee uh, to explore rental assistance as an alternative uh, and um, see if there's anything down that path that may be, uh, may be viable for us. So those are those are my comments. Great. Thank you, Scott. So it sounds like we have a request or a, I don't know if it's a motion to have a second ad hoc committee to look at potential rental assistance programs. And I, I actually do agree that that's an option we should be looking at. Um, and so uh, maybe the city uh, attorney or city manager can help me with the mechanics here, how we would set up that. As you are acting as the the chair of the body this evening, per policy, you have full discretion to appoint an ad hoc committee. Uh, you can also ask to do it by a vote if that's your preference, but you have that authority. Okay, great. So um, what I'd like to do then is, is, is establish a second ad hoc committee for looking at rental assistance. And it sounds like, Scott, you wanted to step up and do that. And I, I would like to do that. So Scott would be one member and, uh, and Catherine. Yeah. I don't think he's still on the call. I don't think he was on the call but at I, all. I'll defer to him as if, uh, if he's interested because he's a more senior member of the team here. Okay. So then the, the members would be Scott and um, it would be Mayor Helmer, unless he doesn't want to, in which case it would be council member way. So uh, with that, let's, let's. And I just, I, I think you're all probably have already thought of this, but I just want to do um, make clear that for Brown Act purposes, the two ad hoc committees should work separately and um, not communicate between each other, which could result in a quorum of the council discussing the same subject matter. So similar to how the current ad hoc committee has worked, um, working with the city manager and then reporting to the council as a whole, the new rental assistance um, ad hoc committee should do the same do their own work, work with the city manager, and then report back to the council. Okay, clear. So so we we have the Brown Act rules that we've been following with the ad hoc for rent stabilization. So what that means is council member Haroff and myself have not really been able to talk to any of the other members about what we've been doing, our meetings, our research, although the meeting, for example, the landlord meeting was attended by council member Way, so she had... Yeah. And, and you know she's a member of the audience, and and so we do get information that way. But um, with that, I, I'd also like to say that the rental stabilization ad hoc, of which uh, Councilmember Harriff and I are members, I'd also like to start advancing that. And what that means is um, I'm looking to work closer now with um, city staff, specifically with the city manager and our city attorney, in in exploring what a uh, rent stabilization ordinance might look like. 
And to be a little more specific, um, I, you know, I, I pose the question of fairness, but I also want to pose the question of cost and benefit. So one argument is that some of these programs actually end up harming renters. So that would be a cost, not a benefit to renters, or that they bring more harm or cost to the community because you lose your property tax base or you can't run the rental registry without taking away money from, you know, the sewer drain program or our capital improvements program. So my intention here is to look at an ordinance, not only in its legal framework, but what it means as a value for renters, for the owners, and for the city as a whole. And we're still on, on track. We said we want to, you know, move through this process in 2022 and have something by the end of the year. So I think that's the track we're still trying to follow. And, uh, and that will be our, our, you know, next meetings, we'll be trying to make progress in that. So it sounds like we have two ad hoc committees and, um, Lots of work to do and, you know, lots of input still to receive. Um, anything else from the council? Okay, so with that, I think... I'm sorry, can I, can I ask, do staff need direction for anything at this point? Uh, I don't think we need direction. I, I probably would just add, because I've come to really appreciate that these terms are not particularly well-defined. So I think the rents, if I were starting over, I would have called the rents, I would have recommended calling the rent stabilization ad hoc committee, the rent regulation ad hoc committee, because within the world of this policy debate, rent stabilization, I think is triggering for a lot of folks, a very particular model. And there's a broad array of models under the, the umbrella of rent regulation. And, we'll, and in my understanding in meeting with that hoc committee is you're still exploring all of these different models. Is that a, a recommendation to rename? I don't think it matters at this just, point. I just wanted to put that out in the record since yeah. it does sound like the vice mayor and council member Harp are gonna be working more closely to build a recommendation for what a, an ordinance should look like that um, there's a lot of different flavors of rent regulation. And I haven't sensed from the ad hoc committee that you've yet concluded which one's the right flavor for Larkspur. That's correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so with that, I think we're done with business item 8.1. If I hear no more comments from the council and uh, with that, we move to adjournment. So we have a special meeting on October 26th and our next regular meeting will be November 2nd. And for all of you here who've waited and sat and it's been a very long time, thank you for your patience. and. We promise to keep working hard on this and to keep you informed. Thanks everybody for coming. And and Mr. Vice Mayor, you may want to, since we have a lot of folks who are interested in what the council is working on, the October 26th meeting has two items and they're not related to this policy debate. One is about SB9 and the other one is about the, um, the library project. Okay, great. Yeah, so let me just amplify that a little bit. So SB9 is the uh, state housing law that's mandating, um, you know, how many units we have, and that's something that we're looking at our housing elements. So that'll be on October 26th. And as you all know, we got uh, a matching grant from the, from the state for over 5 million, and we're looking at building the library. So those two, two topics will be discussed October 26th. And then the next regular city council meeting will be November 2nd. And then Vice Mayor, I wanted to clarify whether or not um, council intends to go back into closed session or- Oh, <laughs> and we are going back into closed session. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Okay, and with that, uh, we are adjourned and we will uh, come back to report or we will have to come back to report if there's any- we'll, back session. we'll have to come into, back into open session if there's any any items to report from the closed session. Okay, that was a lot. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> For now, good night, and we'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Good evening, and welcome back to the Larkspur City Council. We just concluded our closed session with no reportable action, so we are adjourning our meeting until the next regular or special session. Uh, good night, everybody, and thank you. Good night.